Hello AMP folks and welcome back to Animal Sciences 142. In today's lecture we're going to look a little bit at bone tissue and also get an introduction to the axial skeleton which includes the skull and the spine. Now there's several learning objectives for today and I'm not going to read through them all but basically you should be able to tell me about the different types of tissue that we find within bones that is compact bone, spongy bone and also the cartilages. Tell me a little bit about the how bones grow and are remodeled. Uh, you should be able to distinguish axial bones from appendicular bones and also identify bones based on their shape. And finally, you should be able to list the components of the axial skeleton. Okay, before we go on to talk about the organs that are bones, let's talk a little bit about bone tissue. So bone is a tissue, it's actually a type of connective tissue, which is composed of cells embedded in a matrix. Remember, like most connective tissues, there's not a whole lot of cells in bone. The majority of what's there is this extracellular matrix, which in the case of bone is composed of collagen fibers, but also calcium phosphate. And it's this calcium phosphate that makes bone really hard and durable, where it's the collagen that makes it able to resist uh, a little bit of stress without breaking. Okay, the skeletal system has a lot of different functions, some of which are obvious and you're probably familiar with, and some of which you probably aren't familiar with. One you are familiar with is support. The skeletal system is basically a scaffolding of hard parts that helps to hold our body erect. Another function you're probably familiar with is protection. The job of the skeletal system is to protect very delicate organs, like the brain, that is protected by the skull, and also the thoracic organs, the heart and the lungs. They're protected by the rib cage. Movement, of course, is also a very important function of the skeletal system because the bones are basically levers to which our skeletal muscles are attached, allowing for movement and lifting and things like that. Another important function of bone is the storage of minerals. As you're probably aware, bone contains a lot of calcium, specifically calcium phosphate. And calcium is important for bones, of course, but it's also important for other processes in the body. For example, we need adequate amounts of calcium for muscle contraction. We also need adequate amounts of calcium for blood clotting. And so if we don't have enough calcium in the bloodstream, we tend to go to our bones and remove that calcium so that we'll have enough calcium for those functions. Another function of the skeletal system and bones in general is hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. And this is the production of blood cells. As you're probably aware, there is bone marrow located in the ends of your long bones and also within the spongy bone within your pelvis. And this red bone marrow contains stem cells that produce red blood cells, white blood cells, and also platelets. And so this is another very important function of bone. And finally, bones are important for hormone production. And we'll talk a little bit about this towards the end of the lecture. So since I mentioned spongy bone, we should probably go back and review the two different types of bone tissue. And the first of these is called compact bone. Now a compact bone is a very dense bone that really doesn't have any visible pores, or at least no pores that are visible uh, macroscopically. And it tends to cover the entire outside of the bone, but it also makes up the majority of the diaphysis. Remember, the diaphysis was the shaft of a long bone. And the functional unit of compact bone is something called an osteon. And we'll take a closer look at an osteon in just a minute. But remember, these were these circular structures that looked kind of like the sectioned trunk of a tree. Now remember that the diaphysis of the bone principally contains yellow bone marrow, which is primarily fat and that 80% of a bone tends to be made up of compact bone. Compact bone is very strong, it's also very smooth. Now the other type of bone that we've already talked about is something called spongy bone. Now spongy bone is a sponge-like bone that tends to be found in the epiphyses of long bones and it's composed of something called trabeculae. Trabeculae is just a fancy word, basically meaning little beams. And so at the bottom right, you can see a microscopic view of spongy bone and take a look at the trabeculae. So the trabeculae are composed of collagen and also calcium phosphate, but they tend to be organized in a way to make sure that they support the stress of the bone. And depending on what type of long bone we're gonna talk about, the stress can be primarily vertical or a little bit more oblique. Now the other thing you should know about the spongy bone is that it contains the red bone marrow. Remember that red bone marrow was a hemopoietic tissue that helped us to generate new blood cells. That is red blood cells, white blood cells, and also platelets. And so one very important function of the spongy bone is hematopoiesis.
Now bones can be classified into one of four different shapes. First of all, we have the long bones. These are bones like the femur, the humerus, bones that are longer than they are wide. They look like traditional bones. And then we have short bones. These are bones like we find in the wrist or carpus and also in the ankle or tarsus. So they tend to be more square or rectangular. So they're short bones. And then number three, we have flat bones. These are bones such as the scapula and also some bones of the skull. And finally, we have irregular bones. These are bones like the vertebrae that don't really conform to any one shape. And finally, there's a fifth type of bone which we haven't talked about, and these are sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones are sesame seed shaped, and an example here of a sesamoid bone would be the patella or kneecap. So our example for a long bone today will be the humerus. The humerus is the bone that makes up the upper part of the arm or the brachium. So the first part of a long bone that you need to be familiar with is something called the epiphysis, or sometimes pronounced epiphysis. The epiphyses are basically the rounded distal ends of the bone. Here you can see we have one that's more superior and another one that's more inferior. So the epiphyses are rounded areas of the bone that tend to articulate with other bones. And the epiphyses of most long bones contain a lot of spongy bone. In addition, most epiphyses are covered with hyaline cartilage because they rub against other bones. Remember, the purpose of hyaline cartilage in a joint or arthrosis is to reduce the friction between two bones. And so most epiphyses will be covered with a nice smooth layer of hyaline cartilage. So whereas the epiphysis was the end of the bone, the diaphysis is the middle or shaft of the bone. The diaphysis of most long bones is composed exclusively of compact bone. And remember, compact bone had the functional unit of the osteon, and we'll review that in just a minute. The other thing you should know about the diaphysis is that it's often hollow. That is, it has a marrow cavity in there in which we can find yellow bone marrow. Oh, and there it is. Our marrow cavity usually houses yellow bone marrow, which is actually fat. Now, unlike red bone marrow, which generates blood cells, the yellow bone marrow really doesn't do anything. We can call upon it on times of nutritional need and metabolize that fat, or sometimes in times of need for more red blood cells, some of this yellow bone marrow can actually transition back to red bone marrow and help with blood cell production. The other thing that we find associated with the diaphysis is a covering called the periosteum. Remember that peri means outside or around, and so periosteum is a type of connective tissue membrane surrounding the outside of the bone, and it's important because it contains lots of blood vessels and nerves, and it also is the source for osteoblasts, which are cells that are going to help us to rebuild and repair bone. So midway between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, we find something called the metaphysis, or metaphysis. And as the word implies, this is just in the middle. And one important thing about the metaphysis is the area where our growth plate is located. The growth plate is an area of actively dividing cells that contains both cartilage and osseous tissue. And the growth plate helps the bones to elongate or grow in length. And we'll talk more about growth plates a little later on in the lecture. Okay, so here you can see a closer view of an osteon. Remember an osteon is the functional unit of compact bone. And osteons are basically circular arrangements of lamellae, which are walls of bone that surround something called a haversian canal. Now the haversian canal is basically a central hole through which blood vessels and nerves run through the bone. And eventually these are gonna merge with the blood vessels that were entering the bone from the nutrient foramina on the outside. And so the center of the osteon contains the herversion canal, which is basically the source of nutrients and oxygen for all the cells that are surrounding it. So the concentric lamellae are walls of bone that surround that herversion canal. And the bone's made up of collagen and also made up of hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphate. But if you take a look very closely at the osteon, you can see little bitty holes or pukas in there, which are called lacuni. And so a lacuna is basically a lake or hole, just like what we found in cartilage, where a cell lives. And the cell that lives in the lacuna here is something called an osteocyte or bone cell. An osteocyte's job is to maintain the surrounding matrix. And so if you look at the top right hand side of the screen, you can see one of these osteocytes. You can see also that there's some small canals that lead away from the osteocyte towards the haversian canal. And these are called canaliculi. 
canal liculi are basically little bitty canals that link the osteocyte to the Haversian canal. And it's important because unlike cartilage where the chondrocytes were isolated from any nutrient supply, the osteocytes have a very good connection to the nutrient supply through these canal liculi. And as a result, bone can grow very fast and it can also repair itself very quickly as well. So in the last slide we talked about the components of the matrix, that is the non-cellular part of bone, and now we're going to talk about the cellular part of bone. So bones have five cells that are important in bone growth and remodeling. We're only going to talk about the top three of these cells, that is the most important three cells. And these include the osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts. So the first of these cells is something called an osteoblast. Remember the word osteo means bone, and a blast is an immature cell that's usually secreting something. And so the job of the osteoblast is to build bone. That is, it takes any excess calcium that we have in our bloodstream and it deposits that into the bone in order to make them stronger. The second type of cell we see is an osteocyte, or bone cell. And this is a mature bone cell that lives within those lacunae in the compact bone or between the trabeculae of spongy bone. And all the osteocyte does is maintain the existing matrix of bone. It really doesn't build new bone. And finally, the third cell is something called an osteoclast. And the word clast means to break down or break away. And so an osteoclast is a cell that actually breaks down bone and frees up calcium for the bloodstream. And osteoclasts are actually derived from a white blood cell, and their job, again, is to break down bone in order to remove calcium from that bone and put it in the bloodstream. And osteoclasts are very important because they help us draw upon the calcium stored in the bones so that we can have adequate amounts of calcium for things that are really important like muscle contraction, nerve impulses, and also blood clotting. And so if you're not getting enough calcium in your diet, chances are your osteoclasts are eating away at your bones and liberating calcium from the bones and putting it back into the bloodstream. So we already said that there's a very narrow set point for blood levels of calcium, and that's between 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. Now you don't need to memorize that number, you just need to appreciate the fact that it's a very narrow range. And so we have a very finely tuned negative feedback loop that governs blood calcium homeostasis. And remember that blood calcium can be coming from the diet, that is through calcium rich foods, or if we're not getting enough from our diet, it's going to come from our bones. Our bones are a very good reservoir for calcium. And so what happens if our blood calcium levels start to drop, we're going to increase our secretion of something called parathyroid hormone. Now, as the name implies, parathyroid hormone comes from very small glands called parathyroid glands. And parathyroid glands are located attached to the backside of the thyroid, or Adam's apple. So here you can see the thyroid gland. Well, that's not the parathyroid. The parathyroid are the little dots at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So they're very minuscule glands, but also very, very important because they secrete PTH, or parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone is secreted in times when blood calcium is lower than normal. And what parathyroid hormone does is it signals our osteoclasts to become more aggressive. It basically tells them to increase in number and also increase their rate of bone destruction. And as they destroy more bone, that excess calcium is going to be taken from the bone and put in the bloodstream. And that should bring us back into homeostasis. That is, the increased activity of the osteoclasts under the direction of PTH should raise our blood calcium levels back into the optimal range of 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. And once that happens, our production of PTH will level off or turn off so that we don't get too much blood calcium. Now your textbook also talks about some other hormones such as calcitonin. Now calcitonin is a little bit important in calcium homeostasis and what it does is help to increase the rate of bone deposition when we have an excess of calcium in the bloodstream. Let's say you've sat down for a calcium rich meal of dairy and a little bit of kale and some other green leafy vegetables. If you get excess calcium in the bloodstream, your levels of calcitonin will increase slightly and this will lead to a slight increase in bone deposition. Now I say slight because as it turns out, we now know that PTH is much more important in regulating blood calcium homeostasis than calcitonin is. So know that calcitonin has a minor function, but that PTH is the one that really regulates blood calcium homeostasis.
So now we're going to take a closer look at endochondral bone formation. And remember, endochondral bone formation was very important for the long bones of the body, such as the femur, the humerus, the tibia, fibula, radius, and ulna, and others as well. And so as the name implies, endochondral ossification starts with a cartilage model. And it's important to realize that all the bones in the fetus before week eight are actually entirely made of cartilage. And so these cartilages are formed by fibroblasts and chondroblasts, and they help to build this cartilage model. Now once that cartilage model is laid down, it will begin to grow under the direction of our fibroblasts and also our chondrocytes. But the other thing that will happen is we'll form a bony collar around the diaphysis of that cartilage model. And the bony collar is important because it limits the diffusion of nutrients into the inside of the cartilage model. As a result, the cartilage cells that are in there start to die off because they don't have any nutrients. And so that dark area you can see within the diaphysis or shaft of this cartilage model is actually dying cartilage cells. Now around month three of development, we form something called the primary ossification center. And as the name implies, the primary ossification center is the initial site of ossification within this newly forming bone. And the way in which this happens is basically a periosteal bud comes in from the outside and bores its way into the inside of this marrow cavity. And the periosteal bud contains lots of stem cells. Some of these cells will become osteoblasts, that is the cells that build bone. Some of them will become nervous tissue and some of them will become vascular tissue. And so the first cells that actually ossify this are going to be our osteoblasts that build spongy bone. So the first bone that's actually laid down is spongy bone, and it's laid down initially within the diaphysis. Now once that primary ossification center forms and extends out towards the ends, we then have invasion of our osteoclasts. And the osteoclasts will basically eat away the internal part of the spongy bone that made up the diaphysis. They will leave the bone on the outside, which is compact bone, but eat away that spongy bone. And this is important because these osteoclasts are basically helping us to clear up a medullary cavity. And the medullary cavity was just the hollow part of the shaft of the long bone. And so the last part of endochondral bone formation is the formation of a secondary ossification center. And the secondary ossification center forms within the epiphysis or epiphyses of the long bones. And just like we had with the primary ossification center, we have basically the invasion of a periosteal bud from the outside, which bores its way uh, into that cartilage and then releases osteoblasts, which begin to convert that cartilage into spongy bone. Now the big difference that happens here is that within the secondary ossification centers, we don't see any movement of osteoclasts into that area. That is, they don't eventually eat that bone away and form a cavity. And so what remains in the tips of the long bones is a nice core of spongy bone, but it's surrounded on the outside by the remnants of that cartilage that'll form the articular cartilages, and also cartilage inferior to that, which will be called the growth plate. And we'll talk more about the growth plate in just a minute. Now remembering back from the last slide, we said the secondary ossification center really ossified the epiphyses or distal ends of the bones. And it's important to realize that this ossification is incomplete. It leaves a nice thick coating of cartilage on the outside of the bone, which will be called the articular cartilage or joint cartilage. And initially it also leaves a piece of cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And this piece of cartilage is called the growth plate or epiphyseal line. And the epiphyseal line is very important because it contains lots of actively dividing cartilage cells. And these cartilage cells will lay down new cartilage uh, adjacent to the epiphysis. And basically that new cartilage will cause elongation of the bone, forcing the epiphysis away from the diaphysis. Now as this bone elongates with cartilage, the cells on the back side, the diaphysis side of this growth plate will begin to break down and this tissue will become ossified with calcium phosphate. So it once was cartilage, now it becomes bone and it will also be hollowed out by our continuous action of our osteoclasts. So the result of this growth plate is that bones are elongating and growing in length and at the same time they're hollowing out due to the activity of our osteoclasts. Now the second type of bone growth that we have is something called appositional growth. And appositional growth is the growth in the width or girth of a bone. And unlike growth in length, appositional growth can go on throughout life. And so appositional growth involves stressors on the bone which initiate the activity of osteoblasts. 
Remember, osteoblasts are the cells that build bone, but here they're originating from the periosteum. So if you take a look at the picture at the top left-hand side of the screen, you can see the periosteum and has blood vessels going through it, and there's a depression where one of those blood vessels is running. Now what happens is that the osteoblast will then begin to build up bony prominences around that blood vessel, like you see at the top right. Now over time, those prominences will merge to form a complete new layer of lamellar bone around that blood vessel. So the blood vessel is now surrounded, it is a haversian canal, and it now makes up a new osteon. Now if you remember back to the first part of the lecture, we said that one of the functions of bones was hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. This is the manufacture of blood cells, and that is certainly something that does happen within long bones. The tissue where this happens is called red bone marrow, and in long bones it tends to be found in the epiphyses, that is the distal ends of the long bones. Yellow bone marrow, on the other hand, is found in the shaft or diaphysis of long bones. So yellow bone marrow is composed primarily of adipose tissue, and so it's really there as an energy reserve. It doesn't have a role in producing blood cells. However, in extreme cases of anemia in some animals, this yellow bone marrow can be partially converted back to red bone marrow, so it can assist with hematopoiesis. So now that we've talked about the generalized structure of a long bone, I want to spend some more time talking about the articular surfaces. Now, articulation here means to connect or touch. So anywhere that a bone touches another bone is an articular surface. Now, articular surfaces are often varied in their anatomy. For example, there's something called a condyle, which is a large, round articular surface. So these are large, um, sort of semicircle-like protrusions that articulate with something that would be an indentation that's complementary to it. So we find, for example, condyles uh, at the distal ends of the humerus and also at the distal ends of the femur. On the other hand, the proximal end of a long bone is often referred to as the head. The head here is usually spherical, and the head usually only has one articular surface, whereas the distal end of the bone often has two. So we have a head at the proximal end of the femur and a head at the proximal end of the humerus as well. And finally, we have something called a facet. A facet is a flat articular surface. For example, if you take a look at the vertebrae picture at the lower right, you can see the area where the two vertebrae are overlapping is what we call their articular facet. Two flat parts of adjacent bones rub against each other and connect. Another bone feature is something called a process. A process is basically a pointy projection off of the surface of a bone. Now most of these pointy projections are actually attachment sites for muscles. For example, take a look at the vertebrae at bottom right. You can see a vertical spine of bone sticking upright there called appropriately the spinous process. Towards the sides there, you can see two transverse processes. Now both of these are those little projections that stick up in your own spine uh, when you bend over. If you've ever been to a swimming pool and there's that really skinny kid and he bends over and his back looks like a stegosaurus, what you're seeing there are spinous and transverse processes. And again, there are important attachment sites for muscles of the back. Other bone features that we'll see in our second lecture include things called trochanters and tuberosities. Trochanters are found on bones such as the femur and their connection points for very large muscles. On the other hand, tuberosities we find, for example, on the humerus, and this is a connection point for the deltoid muscle. So tuberosity is usually a little hill or rough patch that is a connection point for muscles. A foramen, on the other hand, is a hole through which blood vessels, nerves, or other structures pass. For example, at top right, you can see the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is a very large hole in the back of the occipital bone that allows passage of the spinal cord into the vertebral column. The plural of foramen is foramina, so both of these words mean holes. On the other hand, a fossa is not a hole so much as a depression. For example, take a look at the picture of the scapula at bottom right, and you can see that there's a spine there in the middle, but on either side of the spine is a supraspinous fossa, and then below that an infraspinous fossa. These fossa are usually connection points for very powerful muscles.
Okay, so now that we've had an overview of bone tissue, we're going to go talk about the specific bones of the axial skeleton. Now, axis here means line, and so we're talking about all the bones that are in a relatively straight line, starting with the skull, the vertebral column, and the ribs, and also the sacrum and the tail. These are all part of the axial skeleton. Now we're going to start out with the most complex part of the axial skeleton, which of course is the skull. The skull itself is comprised of 37 or 38 separate bones, and it has two different groups of bones. The cranial bones, which surround the brain, and the facial bones, which make up the jaws and the rest of the face. Okay, first let's take a look at the bones that make up the cranium, and the most obvious of these are the frontal bones. The frontal bones make up the superior part of the orbit, and they're the part of the head that you hit when you slap yourself in the forehead. So every time Homer Simpson slaps himself in the forehead, he's in fact slapping his frontal bones. These bones are very thick and also very strong. On the back of the skull, we have the occipital bones. The occipital bone surrounds the foramen magnum. Remember, that was that hole that allows the passage of the spinal cord from inside the cranium to the uh, spinal canal. On the outside of that foramen magnum, we also have two structures called the occipital condyles. These are rounded structures that allow the skull to articulate with the atlas, which is the first cervical vertebrae. Our next set of bones are the parietal bones. The parietal bones are paired bones which are located in between the frontal bones and the occipital bones. They tend to be a lot thinner than the frontal bones and more prone to injury. Just rostral to the parietal bones are the paired temporal bones. As the name implies, these are the bones that make up the temples of the animal. Now they have a couple of important features. The flat part of the temporal bone is called the squamous part. Remember, squamous means flat. And then you can see a projection coming off that bone, and that's called the zygomatic process. This is part of the temporal bone, which makes up half the zygomatic arch, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And then below that, you can see a hole that's very conspicuous called the external acoustic medius. This is the passageway for sound waves into the middle and inner ears. And finally, the large swelling that you see around the external acoustic meatus is called the tympanic bulla. The tympanic bulla surrounds the inner workings of the middle and inner ear. Our next bone is the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a really important bone because it is the keystone bone of the cranium, that is, the bone to which most of the other bones are attached. The sphenoid bone also makes up the entire floor of the cranial cavity, as well as most of the sides as well. It extends well up into the orbits. Most of the sphenoid bone is actually inside of the cranial cavity and can only be viewed once you remove the top of the skull. Now, while we're on the subject of cranial bones, I just want to make a mention of how these bones are connected. Remember, we said that everywhere that a bone is connected with another bone is either called an articulation or an arthrosis. In this case, the arthroses or articulations are going to be non-movable ones, and these are called sutures. So here you can see an example of a suture between the parietal bones and the occipital bones. This is where bones grow together, they're fused, and they're non-mobile. Now we're going to go on to the facial bones. These are bones that don't directly encase the brain, but are still important in either forming the jaw or the superficial bones of the face. And the first of these are the incisive bones. And there are two of them, and of course, as the name implies, they bear the incisors, or incisive teeth. The next bone that you see is a very small bone called the lacrimal bone. The lacrimal bone makes up a small part of the medial part of the orbit, or eye socket but it's also important because it has a tear duct in it called the lacrimal duct, and this allows passage of tears from the eyes back into the nasal cavity. Our next bone is the mandible, or lower jaw. Of course, this is a very important bone for chewing, and it is also a bone that must be very strong to withstand the muscular pressure that is applied by the masseter and temporalis muscles. Important features of the mandible include the body, or main part of the mandible, as well as the ramus, which is the vertical part. At the tip of the ramus, we have something called the coronoid process. This is an important connection point for muscles of the temporalis. And in the back here, we have something called the angular process, and finally, the condyle of the mandible. This condyle articulates with a groove on the temporal bone to form the temporomandibular joint. In the upper jaw, we have the maxillary bones. The maxillary bones, along with the palatine and the incisive, make up the hard palate, that is, the hard part of the upper jaw.
They're also important because they bear the large canine teeth which are deeply rooted within the maxillary bone. Our next bones are the paired nasal bones. As the name implies, these cover up part of the nasal cavity and they also make up the dorsal aspect of the snout. As you're probably already aware, there's a lot of variation in the length of the snout and length of the nasal bones among different breeds. For example, we have some dogs that have very short snouts, such as your American Bulldogs and also your Pugs, and we call them brachycephalic. Brachy here means short, and cephalic means head, so literally short head. On the other hand, dogs such as Labrador Retrievers and Golden Retrievers, which have a normal dog-like face, are said to be mesocephalic. And then dogs with very long snouts, such as collies and some greyhounds, are termed dolicocephalic. Now it's important that you realize that the length of the snout is not just something that's ornamental here, but it actually has a bearing on the animal's health. Dogs that are very short-snouted or brachycephalic oftentimes have more breathing disorders, such as apnea and snoring, and they also overheat more easily because they have shorter turbinate bones and aren't able to dissipate heat as easily by panting. The last thing that you need to keep in mind is that brachycephalic dogs have more problems coming out of anesthesia because of their modified airway. Now for this reason we often leave these dogs intubated until they're awake and standing up before we remove that endotracheal tube. And you'll learn more about that if you go on to the anesthesia course next year. Our next bones here are probably one of my favorites. They are the zygomatic bones. Not only do they have a really cool name, but they also serve a very important function. They make up the lateral wall of the orbit, or eye socket. They also form part of the zygomatic arch. Now this was the arch that extended in between the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone. Part of that arch is made up of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, but the other part is made up of the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. It's confusing, I know. But the arch is important because it allows passage of the very large and important muscles of mastication, our temporalis and our masseter. Now some breeds of cats, for example the Siamese, have very prominent zygomatic bones, which is one of the reasons people like that breed. And of course some people do too. If you look at some of the top models in Europe or Cher or something like that, a lot of times these people have their jobs because they have very prominent zygomatic bones. Now we're almost done with the bones of the skull, but there's a few facial bones we need to consider. First of these is something called a vomer bone. The vomer is a single bone located in the midline of the skull that forms the inferior part of the nasal septum. This is the wall between the left and right halves of the nasal passages. Within there you can see two of the turbinate bones. The turbinates look like roses looked at from above. That is, they're scrolls of bones that are normally in life covered with mucosal epithelial tissue. And so as the animal breathes in, they act as radiators and help to warm and humidify that air. And as the animal breathes out, it helps to carry excess body heat away, and so that's why a dog can use panting as a form of thermoregulation. The other bones we need to mention here are the palatine bones. The palatine bones are found on the median surface of the skull and make up the posterior one-third of the hard palate. That's why they're called palatine bones. Another miscellaneous bone of the axial skeleton is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone which is actually derived from an embryonic gill arch, same as the lower jaw. Now the function of the hyoid bone is to support the base of the tongue and also make up the superior part of the larynx, so it's important in swallowing. Okay, now we're going to shift gears and move on to the vertebral column. Now the vertebral column is still part of the axial skeleton and it has two functions. One, to protect the spinal cord and two, to give the body a firm supporting rod to which we can attach our arms and legs and have an animal that can move around on all fours. Now the key features of the vertebrae include the central body, shown here, which articulates with the bodies of adjacent vertebrae. Above that we have the vertebral foramen. This is the hole that protects the spinal cord, and the individual foramina of each vertebrae line up to make a large canal called the vertebral canal or spinal canal. So the most conspicuous projection from the vertebrae is the spinous process. This sticks up from the dorsal surface of the vertebra and is an important connection point for the epaxial or extensor muscles of the back. And then we have the transverse processes. These extend out from the vertebrae at a 45 to 90 degree angle and within the thoracic region these are responsible for articulating with the ribs. And finally we have the cranial and caudal articular processes. These help individual vertebrae connect to one another and prevents the backbone from hyperextending.
Other structures of the spine that we should consider are the intervertebral foramen. These are holes that are created when two vertebrae articulate with one another, and there's a notch in the cranial vertebrae and a notch in the caudal vertebrae, and out of that notch we have a hole, and this hole allows for the passage of the spinal nerves. Now the spinal nerves are nerves that are connected to the spinal cord, and they innervate the muscles and glands and so forth. Another feature you need to be aware of are the intervertebral discs. These are fiber cartilage pads which prevent mechanical damage in between the discs when the animal jumps and walks around. Unfortunately, sometimes these discs can herniate or prolapse, that is, they end up out of position, and part of that intervertebral disc can actually impinge on those spinal nerves. When that happens, we're going to have a lot of pain and possibly even some paralysis. Okay, now that we've learned a little bit about the general anatomy of the vertebrae, we're going to go on to learn about the five different regions of the vertebral column. Starting with the neck, we have the cervical vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae are very small and minute, which allows for a lot of movement in the neck of a cat or a dog. Most mammals tend to have seven cervical vertebrae, although there are a few exceptions. In back of the cervical region, we have the thoracic region. These are larger vertebrae which articulate or connect with the ribs, which help to enclose and protect the thoracic cavity. In back of the thoracic vertebrae, we have the lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae are usually quite a bit larger than the cervical vertebrae, and they're more for support. And finally, we have the sacral vertebrae. The sacrum is a fused region of vertebrae which helps to anchor the axial skeleton onto the appendicular skeleton. And finally, in back of that, we have the coccygeal vertebrae. These are the tail vertebrae. They tend to be very small and delicate and variable in number. Okay, this table just lists the vertebral numbers for some common domestic species. I do expect you to memorize the number of cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral vertebrae for these species. Don't really expect you to memorize the coccygeal vertebrae. Now what you can notice is that all of these animals have seven cervical vertebrae in the neck, and indeed that's pretty common for most mammals. If we take a look at the thoracic vertebrae, however, there are differences. Humans, for example, have 12 thoracic vertebrae, whereas cattle have 13, horses 18, and cats and dogs 13. The number of lumbar vertebrae are likewise a little bit variable, with 7 in the cats and dogs, and 6 in the horse and cattle, and only 5 in humans. Now the sacral vertebrae, remember, are pretty much fused, so we, we have 3 fused sacral vertebrae in cats and dogs, and 5 in horses, cattle, and humans. So I said in the last slide that most mammals do indeed have seven cervical vertebrae, but here's a question for you. How many cervical vertebrae do you think a giraffe has? After all, a giraffe does have a pretty long neck. Well, the answer here is also seven. Giraffes, like most mammals, have seven cervical vertebrae, and what this means is the vertebrae have to be a lot longer and also a lot stronger, and proportionally, a giraffe's neck is not nearly as flexible, let's say, as a cat's neck or a dog's neck, because here we have to optimize this structure for strength rather than for flexibility. The atlas and axis are the first two vertebrae of the cervical spine, and they're modified to allow for movements of the head. The first vertebrae here, C1, is called the atlas, and this is named after the titan of Greek mythology, that is that guy that held the world on the back of his shoulders. And so the atlas articulates with the occipital condyles of the occipital bone of the skull. And there's little grooves in the wings of the atlas there that allow for those condyles to rotate so you can nod your head up and down. At the same time, the vertebrae underneath the atlas is called the axis, and the axis has an extension protruding up into the atlas, and this extension is called the dens. And the dens allows the atlas vertebrae to rotate from left and right, and so this allows the head to turn left or right. Now let's move on to the thoracic spine. Remember that the thoracic spine of cats and dogs have 13 vertebrae. What you can notice is the spines of these vertebrae are quite long, and remember these spines are attachment sites for muscles, and these are going to be the extensor muscles of the back. The other thing you should notice about the spines is the direction in which they point. Initially, they point straight up, but as you go back in the thoracic vertebrae, they begin to point backwards. And then finally, around T11, it points straight up, and the successive vertebrae point towards the head. And so we call T11 the anticlinal vertebrae because it's pointing in a different direction. And this is a very useful fact to know because it can allow you to identify which vertebrae you're looking at on a radiograph. Simply look for the anticlinal vertebrae, the one in the back which is pointing straight up, and that will be T11. You can then count backwards or forwards as necessary.
The ribs are specialized flat bones that encase the thoracic cavity and protect the heart and lungs. Proximally, they articulate with the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae, and the number of ribs and the number of thoracic vertebrae are the same. So in cats and dogs, there's 13 thoracic vertebrae and also 13 pairs of ribs. If we look at the ventral chest wall, we see that the ribs articulate ventrally with the sternum, or at least most of them do. And in between the ribs and the sternum are special cartilages called costal cartilages. And these are hyaline cartilages, and the reason they're there is to give the thoracic cavity a little bit of flexibility so that the bones are not easily broken. It also allows the thoracic cavity to expand during peak inspiration while the animal's breathing in. The ribs articulate ventrally with the sternum. The sternum is quite simply the breastbone, and it forms the floor of the thoracic cavity. It's composed of sternobrae, which sounds similar to vertebrae, but they're really not. And there's a couple different parts of the sternum that you should be familiar with. The manubrium is the most cranial part of the sternum, and the xiphoid process is the most caudal part of the sternum. So after the thoracic vertebrae, we have the lumbar vertebrae. These are the largest bones in the vertebral column, and that's because they must support the weight of the abdominal organs without the added reinforcement of the ribs. In cats and dogs, we have seven lumbar vertebrae, whereas in comparison, horses, people, and also cows have five. Now, because the principal function of the lumbar region is to bear weight, it's also a site where we have intervertebral disc disease. As we said previously, intervertebral disc disease happens when the fiber cartilage discs in between the vertebrae either rupture or prolapse or just impinge on the nearby nerve roots of the spinal nerves and cause extreme pain. Breeds that are predisposed to this include the dachshunds and other small wiener dogs. And finally, the second to last region of the vertebral column is the sacrum, or sacral vertebrae. Now, in cats and dogs, this is composed of three vertebrae that are fused together in one solid mass, and the purpose of this mass is to articulate with the hips or coxal bones of the appendicular skeleton. And we call this joint the sacroiliac joint because it's a joint between the sacrum, which is the largest bone of the pelvic girdle.